This is my third right turn. So why don't I recognize this hall? I've never been here before. The man talking to the camera in the video starts to laugh hysterically between ragged breathing. He's been running. The story's never talked about this. Never said I couldn't leave. He pauses, then quietly whispers. Christ. Hello? His voice trails off as he begins to silently cry to himself at the sound of unintelligible whispers echoing down the concrete halls, though they barely register on the video camera's speakers. The already dim fluorescent lights in the industrial concrete hallway flicker and the man curses loudly. The whispers stop. That's as much as I can understand from the video because the man starts to run again before dropping the video camera. The part of the video is of a man shrieking in agony somewhere in the distance, the empty hall lights dimming slightly before returning to its empty silence. I close the handheld camera's viewfinder and sit in stunned silence. The sound of my Honda's engine humming in neutral becomes the only thing tethering me to my surroundings. I pick up my phone, and I look at the Rando Nautica coordinates, and I curse myself for setting my intention to be abandoned. I thought maybe I would find a stranded kitten or an old mine shaft like everyone else on Reddit. Instead, I'm half an hour out of town parked outside of an empty toy factory. I turn over the camcorder in my lap and realize... It has to be at least 20 years old. The date on the video was 2005. So, how does it still have a charged battery? See, I moved from Utah for work six months ago. I haven't been inspired to write anything for my Urban Explorer blog since. I mean, it's Utah. I was desperate for Randonautica to take me somewhere compelling. And the universe took me here, knowing what I needed. My coordinates brought me to the camera's exact location, thrown out into a ditch along the gravel drive. I look out of my car window at the factory. There has to be more, I just can't let the story end here. So I mold it over for maybe a few more minutes before I put my car in park and I started walking towards the generic old building. Long foreclosed from the company's bankruptcy. The walls were a solid dark beige with hardly any windows or doors to speak of, and the lawn just past the rusted fence nearly matched in color. The entry doors are padlocked, but I have no problem cutting the chain off with the bolt cutters I always keep in handy in my trunk. A chronic trespasser's best friend, if you will. The chain falls to the ground with a solid clunk, and the dusty glass doors swing slightly open. Just as I open the door, a familiar crunch of a car driving on gravel makes me jump and I hide just inside the doorway long enough to see a black truck use the driveway to turn around. My heart is racing. I'm clearly out of practice. I turn around and look at the room behind me, or what I could see of it. Pitch black darkness except for a few feet near the entrance's natural light. I pull my maglite flashlight out of my pocket and shine it around as I walk further in, recording everything on my phone to reference for my blog later. It's mostly boring. Typical abandoned factory stuff. It looks like it had been used as a shelter for someone a long time ago. I walk past an old fire pit turned to ash, and granola wrappers are strewn about on the floor, and I was hoping for something just a little more interesting. I move further in and hear a repetitive banging, like a machine that had been left on and was stuck. Tentatively, I move toward the sound, looking for the source and discover it coming from a room full of conveyor belts just ahead. As soon as I walk past the threshold of the room, I'm hit with a rotting stench that burns my nose. 
I almost dropped my phone trying to cover my face from the god-awful smell. And that's when I see the man, and I nearly shit myself. I scramble backwards towards the entrance and push against the door as hard as I can, but it doesn't give. It's locked from the outside. The man doesn't move, and I realize I'm staring at a dead body hanging from the ceiling, blocking the way of an automatic door trying to close onto him. It was the body of the man from the video. Bang. 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 I can't take my eyes off of it, even as I vomit all over my new boots from the stench, and now I can't go back outside to call the police. The thick concrete walls of the factory have all but disabled my phone's service. Even emergency calls won't go out. I start thinking of the exterior of the building, remembering the lack of doors and windows, and I feel my blood pressure start to rise again. The bile in my throat burning as wave after wave of nausea passes through me. I pick up my flashlight and decide that there has to be another way out. I mean, surely a building this big has multiple fire exits. I push past the automatic door, past the body swinging like a pendulum, and put it out of my mind. I nearly scream when the door slams behind me my small movement of the body giving it the inch of room it needed to close. And at this point, I'm on edge and desperate to find an exit. But I take a few deep breaths and turn back around to plan my next move. As I round the corner, I enter a dimly lit hall, concrete and industrial with creaking pipes just above my head. It was the hallway from the camcorder video. Now, I honestly would have been relieved for the change in lighting if I hadn't seen the video, but now I was walking down the hall in silence, and I can't stop imagining that every creak and groan of the pipes above me could be someone in the halls. Beyond that, they seemed to go on forever. I could walk five minutes in one direction looking at the end of one hall and be just as far away from the end as I would when I started. When I actually reach the end, I nearly cry from relief. An emergency exit door, the red exit sign above glowing like a devil's halo. Except for the exit isn't an exit. I push open the steel bar and I'm greeted by another hallway identical to the one I'm now in. With nowhere to turn around to, I've no choice but to continue on. In this hall, I'm confronted by several left and right hand turns. Sometimes, I'm forced to choose. The left hall that looks the same, or the right hall that has a sloping decline and another exit door. Now I realize immediately after passing through the doorway to the right that it was a terrible mistake. While the scenery is more or less the same, a quiet hum begins to echo throughout the corridor. Thinking of the whispers in the video, I try to turn back and take the left hand path, but the door locked behind me as it shut, the same as all the rest. Sweating, I creep slowly on the end of the hallway before me stretching further and further away as I get closer. And that is when the lights flicker, and for a split second, I'm in the dark with the hot breath on my neck. As soon as they turn off, the lights were back on, and I'm alone. I can't help but to shout my frustration at my situation. The breath was real. I heard it. Hell, I felt it. My cursing echoes down the hallway and my hum grows louder. I snap my head towards a soft, sweeping sound before me, but see nothing, and I rub my temples as a migraine works its way in. I've had stress migraines since I was a kid, and this godforsaken place was making my head split. And the sweeping sound again. This time... I slowly glance over without turning my head to avoid the migraine pains, and I see it. 
At the end of the hall where the light is flickering is a shadow of a man, disappearing in the momentary darkness. Hello? I have nowhere else to go, but I'm shaking. My legs are too afraid to move and the hum crescendos into a chorus as the light bulb overhead glows brighter and brighter and brighter and then pop. The bulb explodes and the shadowy figure disappears into the consuming darkness, leaving me alone again in the silence of the hall. I shake my flashlight and click it on. I look up to a grinning, inhuman face right in front of mine, breathing loudly their hot breath. I scream and drop my flashlight, throwing my full body into a football tackle so I could get out of here. I forgot about taking video with my phone and I just run with abandon. I pass through doorway after doorway. The exit light above each door is my north star. And finally, I reach a door that pushes open into a new room that I hadn't seen before. Lights temporarily blinding me as my vision adjusts and as the door behind me closes. When I can no longer hear the deafening hum and my migraine subsides as I gasp for air. I look down at my hands and I see that I'm still gripping onto my phone with white knuckles and I begin to feel it vibrate with incoming texts. Mom. Logan. Why didn't you come home for Thanksgiving this year? Brandon. Dude, what the hell? You're supposed to pick me up from my wisdom tooth surgery at four. The reception has had to call a cab. And, of course, countless calls from my work. The date on my phone was the same. I'd only been here for a few hours. Thanksgiving was a month away. Brandon's surgery wasn't until mid-December. I try to send a reply to my mom. Is this a joke? It's not even Halloween. But the text turns from blue to green. I can never tell if it was delivered. I try, but I can't make outgoing calls. I didn't even notice that I wasn't alone because of my phone's momentary distraction. I recognize the man sitting in the corner of the room instantly as he rocks back and forth with his arms held tightly around his legs. It's the man from the video. It's the dead man from the video. He breaks his stare away from the exit door to look at me, but then looks away. I'm nearly in tears, whether it is from my relief for the presence of another human being, or because of the dread in the pit of my stomach well. I don't know. How are you alive? I saw your dead body. I saw you hanging. He continues to stare at the door but responds. Alive? I've only been here a few weeks. I just need to wait until they come back so that I can go home. Who? I ask, not really wanting to know the answer. And now he looks at me incredulously. The shadow man, the demon, the devil. You just met him. I'll call him what you want, but he's the one that brought me here too. He told me you would come. He said your intention was to be abandoned. I admit I lost faith, but when I heard your screams, I knew he had fulfilled his end of the deal. Oh, I'm sorry, what? What does the devil know about Rando Nautica? I'm leaving with or without you. I don't know if you saw what I saw, but I'm not about to be face to face with that thing again. And he starts hysterically laughing, eyes wild, identical to the laugh on the video. <laughs> no one really leaves the back rooms, Logan. The shadow man taught me that very hard lesson over these last few weeks. You're right where he wants you. Where he wants us. He motions around us to the sickly yellow carpeting matching the plaster walls of the same color, jutting out at random to make the empty room a maze. No windows. No furniture. 
no additional exit door, just the man and his delusions. He begins to laugh again, his eyes wild, tears running down his cheeks. I start to back away from him towards the entry door, causing him to sober up immediately. You can't leave, Logan. It's time for your appointment. Now the hell it is. I push open the entry door and prepare to run, but find myself staring into the empty eyes of the shadow-faced man. I open my mouth to scream, but no sound comes out. Just coughed up blood. I look down at the black clawed hand pushing an ornate knife into my stomach, and I fall to the floor. On my way down, I hear the man behind me start to whisper, unintelligibly. It feels like hours before I wake in a daze. As I come to, I hear the sound of whispers all around me, and a deeper male voice practicing his hum. My voice. With perfectly clear vision, I see the shape of the man pulling himself into my skin like an outfit, adjusting it so it fits just right. As if he remembered something, he turns around in my skin and comes over to me laying on the floor. He takes my phone from my death grip and dials out grinning wider than I've ever been able to with my face. My mom picks up the phone. I try to scream for her, but I can't make a sound. Hello? The man on my body watches my horrified expression with wild eyes as he leaves through the door. I hear him answer my mom in my voice, very apologetic. I'm so sorry for missing Thanksgiving, Mom, but I promise I'll come see you for Christmas. Story number two. Today started out entirely normal. I got out of work early, grabbed some lunch, and headed home. I figured I should at least try to do something productive with my spare time. Why not get some exercise in, I thought to myself, and so I decided to check out an app, one that my good friend Jason told me about, Rando Nautica. From what I've been told, it's an app that gives you random coordinates near your location, and supposedly, you set out with an intention, and you will find something relevant to that. So maybe I set out with the intention to find something cool, like an old coin or Maybe some neat little knickknacks or something. I don't know. Supposedly, I will find something similar to what I set out for. Or maybe even exactly what I want to find. Either way, it's very intriguing. Jason also let me know that it's just polite to bring something small along with me for the gift. I don't really know, but I'll take his word for it. The app finally downloads... After a bit of navigation, I think I'm starting to understand it. From what I can tell, you set your map to how far you want to travel from your current location. For example, you would just like to take a quick walk. You could set it to only be points within a mile or two from your house. Then you have the app select the destination for you. And to do this, you have to use 20 coins. There's also a discovery page where you could see other people's experiences and intentions on their journeys. So, I decide to use my 20 coins and find a random spot. I mentally set an intention of finding something neat, maybe an old glass bottle or something like that. I actually have a collection of things I found on my walks or gotten from yard sales and such. My friends like to call me a hoarder, but I really just love old trinkets. Anyways, I have my destination set, and it's actually just on the other side of my neighborhood. So let me set the scene for you real quick. I live in a small neighborhood right outside of town. There's this huge forest on the back side of my street. It cuts off towards the beginning of the street. After that, it goes all the way down and circles the dead-end cul-de-sac type thing at the end of the street. Sometimes, to make it quicker... I just cut through the forest if I'm going into town. 
It's just a nice little walk through nature. Plus, it's a pretty well-traveled area with paths and generally very little wildlife. Now that that's out of the way, back to my story. I start getting all my things together, throwing random stuff in a backpack, grabbing a water bottle, and even a small satchel in case I find anything neat. This is mostly to make this feel more like a real adventure, and less like an adult man going on a little walk in hopes of finding someone's old trash. As I always like to say, pretty much everyone's trash is my treasure. And I'm finally off, on my way to the destination. As I started going through the woods, my phone has decided to redirect my path. It's probably nothing, but either way, it feels off. The GPS begins to lead me through part of the woods I've never seen before. It seems kind of eerie back here, honestly. See, this is the part where no one usually goes, which means the brush underfoot is super thick, and the only trails are deer trails. However, I kind of feel like I'm already here, so I just continue on my way. After about five minutes have passed, I'm really starting to feel uneasy. It's probably just because I've never been in this part of the woods before. But I remember growing up, people would always say that there was this woman that roamed the woods. And the old legend has it that she stood ten feet tall and devoured the souls of little boys. I guess every town has their little urban legends. I never believed in them. Till now. There's this something about walking the woods alone, especially in a part you're unfamiliar with. I keep thinking of every cryptid and urban legend I've ever heard of, thinking of how any of them could just be around the next corner, hiding behind a tree, waiting to swallow me whole. I had to convince myself that those stories are all fake and probably started by some cruel teenager just to scare the little kids. But as I'm walking, I start to feel more uneasy with every step I take. I could hear my heart thumping in my chest. I have no clue why. I haven't just turned around and went home yet. But something's just making me want to keep going. I'm not sure if it's my curiosity or the amount of adrenaline I have flowing through me right now. Assumingly, from fear. And so I keep going. And before I know it, I have no clue where I am. My phone is also acting super weird. I look in the top corner, and there it is. No service. Awesome. I love being lost in the woods without any sense or direction. But the GPS is still there on the app. But after I reach my destination, I just have to try and find my way back. But at this point in time, I have no choice but to keep going on my way. I mean, sure, maybe I do have a choice, but once again, I'm already here, so obviously, why stop now? I feel like I've been on this little excursion forever. I check my phone again, and I've only been walking for 12 minutes. And as I'm walking, I keep hearing what sounds like a second set of footsteps, almost like someone's following me. But I can't tell if I'm just freaking myself out, or if I'm actually hearing them. I start walking, they start walking. I stop, and they stop. I just have to convince myself that there's nothing out here besides maybe some deer or squirrels. Now I'm getting really close to the destination, but I'm not exactly sure where the destination is. Most people find something like a clearing in the woods, or something pretty like that. But this just seems like nothing, and I'm starting to feel a little let down. Almost immediately after realizing my GPS has once again rerouted, taking me further into the woods this time, I hear something that sounds like a woman. It sounds like maybe a woman crying, but I'm not too sure. But for some reason, all the tall tales of people being lured into the woods by something like this just slips my mind. And so I call out, Hello? The crying stops immediately. Hello? I say again, this time a little louder. But nothing. I started jogging in the direction I heard the crying coming from, totally ignoring the route. 
I go further and further into the woods before I realize I really must be lost. I try to reopen the app to see if the GPS is still pulled up, but it wasn't. So there I was, lost in the woods, probably lured in there by some creature, and seemingly going to be devoured by some weird cryptid. I sit down trying to calm myself, I, doing breathing exercises, hell anything. It feels like my head is underwater and my lungs are about to give out. And then I hear it again. More footsteps. I look in the direction they're coming from to see a woman. She looks scared, alone, and a little weak by the way that she's standing. She looks at me, presumably the same way I'm looking at her, wide-eyed and afraid. Hey, the way her voice cracks from her mouth sounds like metal grinding against pavement. Are you lost? I try to sound confident in this, but it sounds more like a whisper than an actual phrase. She nods her head and takes a few shaky steps forward before leaning onto a large tree for support. I mean, who knows how long she's been out here. She's filthy dirty and it seems like she's been out here for a while without food or water. She slowly sits down, sliding down the tree for support and tucking her knees into her chest. I walk over to her and try asking questions like how she got here or is she okay? All of which were met with her shaking her head and looking at the ground. I'm assuming she's just too weak from being alone in the woods for so long, so I try to help her up. How did you find me? She asks shakily. I didn't feel like explaining the entire story of why I'm here, so I just kind of chalked it up to... I was just out for a walk and I heard you, so I came by to see if you were okay. Do you know the way out of here? As she says this, she looks me in the eyes for the first time in the ten minutes we've been here. She's actually quite beautiful. Her features are small and sharp, kind of like an elf or fairy or something. However, when two people are lost in the woods, and one of them is on what seems like the verge of death, it isn't really ideal to say, hey, you know, you're actually really pretty. So I just tried to think of how I even got here. I think I came from over that direction. I point over my shoulder. But I took a couple of turns after a little ways, so... I'm not exactly sure. After hearing this come out of my mouth out loud, I realize that I'm absolutely zero help. She just looks down again, seemingly defeated. Now not to make this situation about me, but I really hope she doesn't start crying again. I mean that would have been super awkward. So instead, I suggest we start going in the direction that I hope is the way I came from. She agrees. I help her up and we're on our way. After just a few minutes of walking, she starts to take the lead. Maybe she has hope of getting back home now, because she seems less weak and almost excited. As we keep going, I'm trying to direct us in the way I believe I came through, but she keeps suggesting going a different way. I'm not really one to assert myself in a situation like this, but I feel like maybe her advice isn't really the best. After all, she's the one that was lost in the woods for a while. Now since I'm kind of a pushover and would rather die in the woods than tell someone they may be wrong, I'd just go along with it. And maybe because I'm a pushover, or maybe because she's a nice looking woman, either way, here I am. I feel almost hypnotized to follow her. Like I couldn't suggest going a different route, even if I wanted to. So after what feels like about 15 minutes, we come upon a clearing in the woods. It's starting to get dark, and I'm starting to feel like maybe this wasn't the greatest of ideas. She turns around and looks me dead in the eyes. This is a nice clearing. Maybe we should rest here a little bit. I'm feeling kind of weak from walking. Almost, almost as soon as she says this, 
I realize how tired I am. Now somehow, we've been tramping through the woods for almost three hours. Now I know three hours isn't a lot, but I'm a pretty lazy person. Most of my nature walks take 15-20 minutes or less. So I agree, and I have a seat on the damp ground. As we're sitting there, I feel myself starting to drift off to sleep. I want to stop myself, but I feel like I can't. My eyelids feel like 100 pound weights, and before I know it, I'm asleep. I wake up to her shaking me. I must have been asleep for a while because it's now entirely dark outside. Thank God it's a full moon because otherwise we wouldn't be able to see anything. I just now realize I haven't asked her name yet. We're basically strangers, but when you're seemingly stranded in the woods with someone, you should probably get to know them a little bit. Hey, I never asked. What's your name? Adeline. Get up. We have to go. The look in her eyes seems urgent, so I don't question it. I hop up and start walking behind her. I heard voices coming from this direction. Maybe if we're fast enough, we could find them. Gleaming with hope, we both start jogging. Now, I'm not sure where she got all this energy from, but I don't care. I'm ready to go back to civilization. The next couple of minutes feel like a blur. It's probably because I'm still trying to wake up from my sleep, but everything feels off. The forest has gotten way darker. There's almost no trees, and it has gone entirely silent. Eerily quiet. No bugs, no small leaves crunching, not even the sound of the wind. Nothing. I start to feel as if I'm in a trance. Like when you're dreaming, and you feel like you're watching yourself from outside of your body. I can't control anything I'm doing, yet I'm aware of every move I make. Something is definitely wrong. I just can't figure out what it is yet. I try to say something, but all that comes out of my mouth is a whisper. I'm starting to feel faint. I try to speak again. <sighs> I feel like my lungs are about to explode. I can't even get out a simple word like, hey. Come on, we gotta keep moving, you'll be fine. Adeline says this like a mother does to a screaming toddler in the grocery store. I'm not sure why she was so harsh about it. Maybe she just has really high hopes to find someone. She doesn't want me slowing us down anymore. Either way, I'd like nothing more than to go home, so I try my best to keep up. We're almost there. Then there's something off about her voice. It's almost malevolent. What do you mean, almost there? Do you know where we are? You'll see. She smiles back at me. I could feel my heart pounding throughout my entire body. I want so badly to stop, to turn around and run the opposite direction, but I can't. It's almost like I'm being hypnotized by this woman. I have no will over my own body. We came to a quick halt, and I could barely take in what I'm seeing. A perfectly round clearing in the forest, with no way out except where we're standing. Trees line the edges, branches so tangled together they seem woven. Despite being in the middle of the woods, the ground is made of the greenest, most luscious looking grass I've ever seen. In the very middle of the circle lies a pile of half burnt wood, I'm assuming for a fire. Scattered in a perfect circle, there are dozens of small ruts in the ground. They almost look like little seats for a weird cult gathering or something. Now I realize that I need to get out of here. I try to move, but I'm paralyzed. Adeline turns around slowly. Nice place, isn't it? I like to think we keep a pretty clean house around here. She smiles in such a grotesque way that my stomach churns. I try to say something, anything, but I fail. Despite the fact that I can't move, I begin to panic, and it's very obvious. Come, 
Adeline gestures towards the circle, and I feel my body moving me closer into the place. Still smiling, she lets out a little chuckle, then says, No need to worry, you're in good hands. I try to move even though I know I can't. Adeline snaps her fingers and I fall to the ground. My vision is going in and out almost like I'm going to black out completely. Then I see her, it, standing above me. It begins to let out a gut-wrenching scream while simultaneously growing. The stories were true, I thought to myself. She keeps going, getting lankier and more terrifying the taller she grows. Finally, when she's done, I begin seeing small flashes of light flying through the air, each of them zooming around the woodpile to their assigned ruts in the ground. As each one hits the ground, it turns into a child. But not a normal child, no. These are all little boys. They all looked malnourished and thin, with a certain bloodlust in their eyes. My children, it's time for a feast. The children all start chanting unintelligible things, each of them seeming to say something different. It stoops down beside me. You always thought they were lying to you, didn't you? Lying about me, lying about me. Do you remember your friend Toby? How he went missing? The police chalked it up to kidnapping. It places a hand on my arm and smiles. I thought they would find out about me. You see... Toby wasn't alone when I, well, you know. It pauses almost like it's proud of taking all these children and turning them into whatever they are. It stands up, towering above me in gestures for the children to gather around. Everyone said I wasn't real, just an old tale told to young boys to keep them out of the woods. Well... I guess we know how that worked out, don't we? It claps twice, and all these children just start tearing into me. I wake up in a perfectly round clearing in the forest. No way out except where we were standing in my dream. There are little mushrooms in the earth encircling me. I get up and begin my trek home. I'm not sure where... That app took me. I'm not sure if I was dreaming the entire time or if someone actually led me out there. All I know is that I removed Randonautica from my phone. And I have never used it again. Story 3 The wooden fence creaked as I pulled myself up and over the rotting planks. In the background of the abandoned ranch house, an empty pool had filled with leaves and other detritus. My face twisted into a grimace at the horrid stench permeating the backyard. I looked around, unable to find the source. Broken windows previously boarded up had been torn open. Old plywood lay in rotting piles nearby, along with smaller holes in some of the boards. A destroyed gazebo had fallen over from the storm's past. The flimsy metal legs bent like a collapsed spider. Torn fabric flapped as thunder rumbled in the distance, alerting me of a coming storm. I was following the trail of Elliot Polycom, a fellow St. Paul officer looking on Hill 10, too. I touched my radio's transmit button. Unit 14, request backup. I found a house out here in Hill 10. Go and take a look. Understood, Unit 14. If you run into Officer Elliot, tell him to radio back. Charlotte's voice was filled with stress, since she hasn't heard from Elliot all day. The radio groaned as I released the transmit button. Will do. Unit 14 out. Looking down at the missing persons flyer I held... It shook in the wind, a picture of 10-year-old Nora Albert smiling back at me. 
Her golden eyes are set in an ebony complexion, taken at a family barbecue. A wave of sadness washed over me as I tucked the flyer back into my pocket. She'd been missing for almost a week now, last seen here in the forest with her family on vacation. The family said that they had been using an app to search the surrounding area. I think back to our briefing. Rando Nautica is what the chief had called it. An app for exploring sounded like a good idea. Till it wasn't. With a lack of cell towers in the area, I imagine her phone quit working. Which was also why we hadn't been able to pinpoint her location. I moved forward, carefully stepping over left-behind children's toys and overgrown weeds, walking through a gate in the fence to the front yard, which wasn't in better shape. I looked around. Several discarded bikes lay against the shrubs growing over the house's exterior. A dilapidated Crown Victoria sat on flat tires. Every window broken or cracked. Baseball bat had been left in the windshield, the vandal having not cared for the tool anymore. My inhaler squeaked as I took a puff. The two-mile incline through the forest and rock had been rough. Several times the altitude change had forced me to halt so that I could readjust. St. Paul PD, anyone inside? I yell out. No one answered. The driveway had been almost completely swept away by a rug of moss, and turning to the front door, I stopped cold. On the door frame, contrasting brightly to the rotted brown color, red shined bright. If it had been just a few speckles or even several days old, I would have missed the fluid. But this was not just a little bit, and it was very fresh. The entrance looked as if someone bleeding had been drugged across the threshold. Instantly, my pistol was a reassuring weight. I stepped forward one hand with my gun, the other filled with the flashlight. The door lay in the entryway broken into splintered pieces. Cobwebs and a layer of dust had been disturbed by the destruction. My flashlight scanned the trail of red as it rounded the corner of the entryway deeper into the house. Unit 14, situation on Hill 10. Where's the backup? I speak calmly into my radio, taking a step toward the front door. Static is the only answer I receive, but I don't have time to repeat the transmission as something clatters deeper inside the house. Breaking wood followed by a muffled scream. The sound, like a wounded animal in its death throes, causes me to jump. Rushing through the threshold, I hurriedly check my corners and follow the blood trail. Around the corner, I feel bile attempt to escape my throat. Iron from spilled blood hung in the air, followed by the sickly sweet smell of decaying meat. Left to the elements, mold and rot fought for supremacy. I force my body to calm down as it tried to retch. What had been a family now was now a morgue for animal carcasses. Deer, raccoon, well, even several dogs had been here long enough to collect cobwebs. My counting reached 35 animals before the scream stole my attention again. I instantly swung around for a long, dark hallway to greet me. Discolored family portraits mockingly smiled at my terrified breathing. The flashlight illuminated more red liquid across the decayed carpet and worn wallpaper. The first room I entered was a child's room, filled with more animals. Closing the door, a scratching sound stopped me. Opening the door again, it was unchanged, and the scratching stopped. I followed the blood trail into the last room, almost falling into a hole that led to the basement. The entire floor had given away, allowing moist earth to scent the air. I shine my flashlight down, seeing the basement deep below. Dirt covered the basement from an unseen source, so much so that I couldn't even see any concrete. 
I followed the flashlight's beam, scanning the darkness until a metallic reflection caught my eye. It was a familiar gold shield that lay there amongst the debris, and I saw it. A black boot buried under disgusting wood. Elliot? I yelled out, but no one answered. Thunder rumbled ahead accompanied by steady waves of rain. Immediately I jumped into the hole, my boots squished into the earth, and looking up I saw the source of all the dirt. A tunnel had been carved into the foundation of the house. Broken rock was strewn about along with a thick coating of cobwebs. Deep and curving, it swallowed the flashlight's illumination as I tried to look around. I reached down and began removing pieces of wood, trying to get to Elliot. The last piece came up with ease, and I recoiled in horror. But it wasn't Elliot. Leathery skin was pulled tight across the skeletal remains of the person's skull. Gaunt features locked in a painful scream of their last moments. I yelled into the radio again, asking for backup. I thought it was static hissing from the radio in return, but as I turned toward the hole again, I found Elliot. A thin man with dirty blonde hair, now almost black, covered in mud. He was shushing me like a tea kettle ready to boil over. The man was buried in the dirt wall next to the tunnel's opening, covered over by more webbing and compact mud. My hands rushed to holster the pistol and drop the flashlight. I worked him free, pulling hard to dislodge the debris surrounding his trapped form. You need to run, Elliot said, fear gripping his breath. Get the entire police force, National Guard, anyone, and come back. Please. I ignored his pleas and continued until a loud crash above stopped me. That was not the thunder, nor the drumbeat of rain. Something was working its way down the hallway now. I looked up into his scared green eyes. No, you shut up, Elliot. I'm not leaving you. On the other side of the basement, I found a freezer. The interior sloshed with what had been left in there. Hurriedly, I crawled inside as the floorboards from the hallway thundered with movement. Holding up the freezer's lid, I watched as two spindly legs appeared. They probed the air around the hole, each fuzzy leg ending with a hooked barb. Then the creature lowered itself easily and crawled across the ceiling. I lost sight of it, but I heard the click-clack of hooked barbs gripping the wood above. To my right, Elliot's face was locked in horror. Thunder above drowned out all sound. The only notice I got was the sudden pressure on the lid of the freezer. Allowing me to close the lid, I heard the metal groan from the sudden weight. A tapping outside made my heart pound like a drum. Confined in the metal box, my own bodily functions were a cacophony that teased my ears. My pistol was aimed for the lid if it opened. The persistent tapping outside stopped. As I heard Elliot, get over here you freak, he bellowed with fake bravado. The tapping stopped and scuttling could be heard as the creature moved away. I sat there, a tremor forming throughout my body as the metal box only muffled Elliot's horrified scream. The man pleaded as it did something. Like a wet paper bag being torn open, he began screaming the wounded animal sound that I had heard earlier. Time went by in that metal box. Elliot had gone quiet, but the occasional creak of wood or heavy thud locked me in place. Molded food and the foul liquid I sat in became normal after an hour. I decided to peek my head up after a relative stint of silence. A pop echoed as my head lifted the lid. The basement was darker but looked empty except for Elliot who lay on the ground in a twisted lump. As quiet as I could manage, the lid yawned open on squeaky hinge trying to expose me. My clothes dripped with the foul-smelling liquid, 
making a wet slapping sound with my movements. Elliot, I whispered forcefully. Thankfully, he stirred at his name. As I approached him, my boot caught on more webbing, a substance strong enough to hold me in place for a moment. Get up, I hissed. Grabbing his arm, a painful moan escaped Elliot's lips. Fresh blood coated the dirt around him, enough that I knew Elliot needed immediate help if he were to live. I pulled on his arm and the skin was clammy and slick to the touch, and another groan of pain came with the effort. I quit trying to be gentle and pulled hard this time, and with a sickening snap, the limb detached from Elliot's torso without a word. I fell backward with a guttural yell as something moved under him. My pistol was pointed at the mass of flesh that had been Elliot, and the body jerked back and forth and then flipped over, exposing the white yellow of bones broken outwards. Something attempted to pull itself free of Elliot's ribcage, several legs already cracking bone and tearing meat. I didn't want to wait to see what it was, and I opened fire. The percussive bang of my pistol shook the walls around and caused dust to trickle down. Each round pierced the creature with a crack, several of them hitting Elliot's corpse. It jerked as the last round struck home and the creature fell still. My hands shook at the carnage that had befallen Elliot. I found my flashlight in the dirt and turned it on. Something had eaten the flesh around his mouth exposing teeth and gums. The beam of light saw that whatever had pulled him in from the wall had not been gentle. The man's entire back had been left there along with the leg. And I lay on the ground in that damp earth as another sound drew my attention. My heart threatened to leap from my chest as it hammered away. The flashlight and gun followed my gaze to the hole in the ceiling. On the lip of the hole, one of the dark creatures looked down on me with curious hunger. It was the size of a cat as the flashlight found it, but eight eyes looked back. Two huge mandibles ending in dagger-like points clacked together in anticipation. A hose-like mouth drooled thick green saliva. But I wouldn't let it take me like it took Elliot. The gun flashed again as it leapt toward me. Three pulls of the trigger were all I managed before it clicked dry, but that was all I needed as the creature was sent into a backflip, landing with a wet crunch. I stood up quickly, exchanging the empty magazine for a new one. Around me, the house trembled as thunder and rain poured outside. My flashlight looked for any kind of movement, but found none. Finally, I pushed the freezer toward the wall and climbed up into the main level of the floor out of the basement. I quickly ran outside and in the distance I could hear the screams of men yelling. I knew reinforcements had arrived. We never did find Nora Albert. In fact, she's still missing to this day. The rest of the officers checked out the house, found the giant spider carcass, and a few more in the basement. We decided it was best just to demolish the whole building. And so, we did just that. We lit it ablaze that night. We don't know why the app Randonautica was bringing us there. But for whatever reason, it wasn't a good one. <laughs>